Hey, what's up? Jason here from Unity3D.College, and today we're going to talk about the factory pattern. I'm going to show you how you can use the factory pattern in your Unity projects to make them easier to extend and just generally cleaner. The factory pattern lets you defer creation of objects to a class or another method, generally the factory. In our case, we're going to be creating a factory class, and that will create all of our other objects for us, or at least a good number of our other objects for us. Now you might wonder why we would want to do this, and there are a couple reasons. The most basic one is that we get all of our creation of objects into a single place. So we don't have code littered throughout our project creating an ability or a weapon or whatever the thing is different ways. And we don't have to go back in and update these things every time we want to make a change to that. We have a single spot where we get these objects from, our factory, and then we just update our factory or change our factory as needed. But we don't always have to do that either. We can also extend things quite a bit without modifying any code at all when we use this factory pattern. In fact, we don't even have to know the type of the object that we want to get back from the factory. We just have to know some sort of an interface or an abstract class that we expect back. The actual concrete implementation of that won't matter. Now this might not make any sense at all. I'm like, I don't know what the hell he's talking about. How does this actually apply? So let's dive into an actual real world-ish example and I'll show you how you would set this up in an actual project. For our example, we're going to use a basic ability system. So imagine a game where you've got a character or a set of characters and they use some abilities. And to set this up, the first thing I generally do is create an abstract class for the type of thing that I want my factory to return. In this case, it would be an ability. It could be an item, a projectile, or any other type of class that you want to return back. In this case, like I said, an ability makes sense, and an ability needs to do some sort of processing. If we have an ability, we expect it to do something. It could... Well, if you look here, we have a start fire or a heal. It could do one of those. It could do some damage. It could move things, teleport things. Whatever the ability is, it needs to do some sort of processing. Now, on our abstract base class here, this ability class, we don't handle the processing at all. We don't care what the thing is. We just want to make sure that it has a thing called process, a public method, and that it will do something. So let's look at an implementation now. So if we look at our start fire ability, you can see that we just inherit from this base ability class. And then here I override process, and maybe we do some creation of a fire there. You'll see more in a little bit. And then our heal implementation could be something like this. Same exact code, but here we process and we increment some health, right? So this doesn't actually exist, just a comment to show that Hey, maybe here we could increment some health on a character or something. And don't worry, we will go into actual examples of doing that shortly. Or not the health, but pretty close to it. And then we have down below this final thing, kind of the core piece of functionality here. And this is our factory. Our factory is going to be responsible for returning back either a start fire ability or a heal self ability, depending on what we want. And if we look here, this is again a very basic factory sample. We have a method on here called getAbility. It just takes a string for the type of ability, and then we do a switch. We say, hey, if we requested a fire, oh, let's return a new fire ability. If we requested a heal, let's return a new heal ability. And if we didn't find it, we're just going to return null. We could return back something with the null object pattern, like a null ability, but I didn't want to overcomplicate this. And again, this is a very, very simple factory setup probably not how you would eventually set your system up because you usually don't want to be calling in and passing in the word fire or the word heal from your other code to find these things. And well, if we want to extend our factory, say we want to add in a new type of heal or a new type of ability, if I wanted to add a damage ability, I'd have to copy this class and then I'd have to go into my factory and maybe add in a you know, case damage return new damage ability oh, and just imagine I'd created one up here and we have to go in and update this every single time we add a new ability. So the most simple and naive ability factory here isn't going to be ideal but it could work for your situation. If you're not going to be extending this thing out ever or very very rare and just don't care maybe that would work but I want to show you the way that I like to do it which is a little bit more complicated and uses some reflection to make these well follow the open close principle better. 
So let's take a look. Let's open up our ability with reflection. And here we go. So this is in a different namespace. We're in the reflection factory namespace, just so I could use the same class names and reuse them without breaking the project. But let's take a look at this version of the ability. It's a little bit different. Here you notice that we still have the on process or the process right here on line 12, but we also have an abstract string name with only a getter. This is gonna be the name of our ability or more specifically of our ability type. So let's see how that's implemented in some of these other abilities here. So the start fire ability is actually just overriding it and returning fire. Now, if you haven't seen this syntax before, this is just the expression body properties. This could also be written like this where we did a public override string name and then do a getter and return fire like this. Uh, this is just a shorthand version that's in the newer versions of C-sharp to simplify this a little bit and just make it a little less verbose. So here we're just returning fire for the start fire ability's name. And for the heal, you may have guessed, we're just returning heal. Then if we look in our ability factory, this is where things are gonna change up quite a bit. So in our ability factory, we now have a dictionary of abilities or named abilities by name. It's of type string for the key. So that's gonna be our name, notice by the abilities by name, and then the type here. So this is going to give us a dictionary of these names to these types. And then we can use that with some reflection to actually create these objects at runtime without knowing what type of object it is. But let's see how this works. So in our ability factory constructor, first thing I do is get all of the ability types using some reflection. We use assembly.getAssembly and we give it the type of ability. This call right here is just finding the assembly that all of our project is in. Since we're not using uh, project assemblies in this Unity project here, we're just getting the main assembly. We're gonna get all of our classes when we call this get types. So we're getting the assembly here and then we get all of the types in it. And then I wanna filter it with this where statement and I wanna make sure that the type is a class because it could be a struct or something else. I wanna make sure that it's not abstract and that it is a subclass of ability. In fact, this is class is probably redundant with this is subclass of ability. So what this is doing is giving me all of the types in our project that are an ability but are not abstract. So I get the fire ability and the heal ability returned right back here. And this is actually just giving me the types. So I'll have a type object or a type of those things. Then I create the dictionary just by initializing it as a new dictionary. And then loop through each of these types. I'll create one of them and then add them to the dictionary by their name. Now the only reason I'm creating it here, and you may see that it's named temp, it's because I wanna get this name back out of it and there isn't a good, easy, clean way to get the name out without instantiating the object. So I instantiate one here, doesn't make a difference. Put them into the dictionary, but I'm not putting this effect into the dictionary, notice that. I'm putting the type in. So we have this ability name to type dictionary now. So now when I wanna call get ability, well, I pass in the name and I check the dictionary to see if it contains the key. And if it does, I get that value or the type from the dictionary. I instantiate it using activator.create instance and give it the type and cast it as an ability and then just return it back. And then this will work. So this will give me back if I pass in a fire or the word fire, it's gonna give me back a fire ability. If I pass in heal, it'll give me a heal ability. And this other method here, get ability names, will just return me back all of the different keys in this dictionary. So all of the different types that I've found and can use. Oh, you might wonder, hey, what the hell was the point of this, right? Well, first let's see it in action. And then I wanna show you how you can use this to extend out without breaking the open close principle. So let's go into our project real quick. And here I've set up a simple canvas with a panel. This panel is a called a button panel. It has a button prefab that just goes down to here. This is just the, ah, the button's down there, but let me show you what it looks like if I turn on a copy of it here. Just a button here with a ability button script on it. I'm gonna disable that and just hit play. We're gonna watch it in action. I'll talk about how it works and then like I said, dive in deeper. So here you see we have the word fire and heal. And if you look down here at the comments, you see that when I click fire, it says processing start fire ability. When I click heal, it says processing the heal self ability. So 
it works. Um, the name is a little bit different, but that's just because the way I've done these buttons up. So how is this all working? Let's look at the panel. So we open up our panel and you'll see that here I just go through and I get all of the ability names. In fact, oh, I've renamed this to two. This is having some build issues with a beta. So we go through, we get all of the ability names and then we fill those into the buttons. And then when I click the button, we're calling the code on the ability. But we're not using this exact example that I showed you. We're actually going into the one that I use in a real world situation, which is where I change this ability factory or the factories to be static. Let's take a look at that. So if we open up our static factory, you see that it's the same for the ability. My ability is no different. My start fire ability, my heal self ability, they actually are a little bit different. They're doing something. They have some code in here. You'll see that they're finding a player and showing a particle on them instead of just logging something. And then my ability factory, this is where things have really changed. Here I've made the class static. The reason for this is that I don't necessarily want to create a new ability factory every time I want to use it. And I didn't want to make this into a mono behavior singleton because I don't need to instantiate the thing. And I don't have a dependency injection framework, so I can't just inject this factory into all the things that need it. So in this case, I actually do often make these things static. So I'll make my ability factory static, and then that can reflect through and anything in the project can call into it. Now, ideally, making things static is not always perfect, doesn't always work great for testability and stuff, but in my experience, it's worked out great in my Unity projects where injection and stuff isn't, isn't a good option. So here we've got a static ability factory, and the biggest difference here is that I have to make this abilities by name static, and I also need to keep track of when it's initialized, because I don't have a constructor for a static class, I need to well, change it up a little bit. In fact, all I really did was change the constructor to be named initialize factory. And then I check to see if it's initialized. And if it is, I just return. Okay. And the it is initialized check is just checking to see that the abilities by name is not null. So if this has never been created, is initialized, I'll return false and we'll go through and create it. And here it's the same process. Get the abilities, uh, turn them into a dictionary. And you'll see that right here on line 52, no longer null so it will be initialized after that and then we loop through but in my get ability call and in my get ability names to call which doesn't have to have a two in there by the way um, I call the initialize factory method so you might wonder hey that's kind of dumb why we keep initializing it but remember at the beginning we just check to see if it's initialized if it is we don't do anything so it's really not doing anything past that first time, but I lazily initialize it the first time I need to get an ability in case um, it hasn't been initialized yet. So let's actually look at this now in a real project, or not a real, real project, but a realer scene where we have a player. Let's save that. And now we've got this capsule. This capsule guy is our player. And we've hooked this ability system up. You kind of saw the code in the ability earlier. Um, let's look at it actually. Let's go into these abilities. So we have our start fire ability. Our start fire ability, now the process is actually doing some work. Here we're just finding the simple player and calling show particle on them. In a real project, you may be passing in the target of the thing that's processing it. This ability may be on the thing that's processing it. Um, it could be it's generally, I would say, just not something where you're going to go out and find the object. You probably have a cache. Maybe the abilities only work on a single entity. Then you can just cache that once and be good. Uh, or it could be a singleton or something like that. But you may need to process this on a target. And perhaps your process takes a target, like a game object target, or perhaps an interface like an iTargetable, or some other class that you use. In our case, though, like I said, we just find that simple player and show particles. Let's see it. Let's hit play in here. We should get the same buttons initialized. We have our fire and our heal. I hit fire and it found the player, played a thing on him and then stopped. I hit heal, finds the player, plays the heal on him and stops. Pretty cool, right? So remember that our heal self thing, for instance, doesn't necessarily just have to show particle. We could, you know, perhaps get the player, like a bar player equals that, and then just do player dot health plus plus. And we don't have a health on there, so let's just add a health property. And then we can do the player.showParticle. So now our effect is actually incrementing health on a player and showing the particle at the same time. 
So you can see how we can start extending these and changing the functionality without having to change much else. We just modify the code in this heal self ability. And if we wanted to add another effect type, say we wanted a damage self ability, right? Just change this to damage, change this to damage, and maybe do a minus minus here. And I don't know what particle to use. Um, I only have two particles in here, so I'm just gonna reshow the fire particle for now, which is particle zero. And by the way, if you wanna see the player show particle code, it's just looking at an array of game objects, turning one on, and then starting a coroutine to wait for a second and turning it off. Nothing special at all, just something there to give us a little visual indication of what's going on. So here we go, we've got the damage self ability. I'm gonna save that and then jump back over to Unity and let's see it in action. All right, now we're back in here. Let's hit play and see if our damage ability shows up. Oh, there it is. And we can take some damage. I'll see the fire particle as we expected. And if I go to debug mode on the player, we should even see that the health went down by one. If I use my fire, it plays fire, but I don't lose health. Damage actually loses health. And if I cast my heal, I see the heal particle and my health is going up. And remember, all we did here was add a new class. This damage self ability, it's all in one file just to make it a little bit easier in this demo, but this would generally be its own class file. It would be a separate tiny little file that does just this little bit of damage code. And we could add on to this and keep extending things without changing any of our existing code. Notice like when I added this, I didn't have to modify the ability factory. I didn't have to modify the player. I didn't have to modify any of the previous abilities or the base class. We just added it in and it all worked. It makes it nice and easy, like I said, to extend your projects, keep it so you can keep adding on to them without risking breaking things, without changing code constantly. And I think it just makes for a much cleaner project. Now this won't fit into everything, of course. Uh, there are definitely gonna be cases where you don't wanna just try to shove this pattern into them. But if you see a situation where you're creating things and you don't necessarily know for sure what that thing is gonna be, maybe it's data driven, maybe it's input driven or something else, definitely try out the factory pattern and see if it'll fit there and if it'll make things easier for you. Anyway, if you like these kinds of videos, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share, and just drop a comment below so that I know to keep doing these things. I really like doing these uh, pattern videos. I think that they're really important, really valuable, and they're just kind of fun to talk about. So let me know if these are the kind of things that you like to see. Um, bye, and thanks for watching.